Read Smart, the Bailey Gifford Prize for Non-Fiction podcast. This podcast is generously supported by the Blavatnik Family Foundation. Hello, and welcome to everyone joining us for this episode of Read Smart, the official podcast of the Bailey Gifford Prize for Non-Fiction. My name is Toby Mundy, and I'm the Executive Director of the Prize. This podcast is generously supported by the Blavatnik Family Foundation. Over the next couple of weeks, we'll be speaking to all six of this year's shortlisted authors about their fascinating books and unique inspirations. Today, I'm delighted to welcome John Valiant, who's been shortlisted for his book, Fireweather, a true story from a hotter world, published by Scepter in the UK and Alfred Knopf in the US. Uh, John is an award-winning nonfiction writer, a novelist and journalist, and the author previously of The Tiger, the story of vengeance and survival, and The Golden Spruce, A True Story of Myth, Madness and Greed, which won the Canadian Governor General's Award for Nonfiction. He's also written for multiple illustrious publications. John, welcome and thank you for joining us and congratulations on being shortlisted for the prize. Oh, thank you, Toby. Uh, It's really good to be with you. Well, it's great to have you here. There's a phrase in your book that says, we have difficulty imagining things that we've never seen before, which I think is called the Lucretius problem. Can you Elaborate upon that and tell us why it's a fitting uh, epigraph for your work. Sure. Uh, Lucretius was a Roman poet and philosopher, lived in the first century BC, and he observed uh, way back then that people tended to think the, the largest or most extreme thing in the world was the largest thing that they had themselves seen personally. So they were really constrained by their own uh, limitations of experience. And I think this has really come to pass. This is, you know, this is a a human perceptual glitch that uh, is recurrent in our species. And where it manifests in a really painful way is in our understanding of and response to the impacts of climate change. And the most graphic, you know, in, in my limited experience is in a firefighters' response to 21st century fire, uh, which really does burn differently with uh, a, a kind of ferocity and speed that we are not used to. And it has really caught uh, firefighters, uh, especially here in Canada, but really all across um, uh, the planet, uh, the planet's flammable environments. Uh, has caught them um, on the back foot and uh, with really grievous results. And it's, and so we're being forced now to, to recalibrate and, and reimagine and expand our consciousness in this, in this quite violent and violating way. And it's a supreme challenge, I think, for our species and really for our minds. And one Obviously, one fire in particular is the focus of your attention in this book, and it's a fire that engulfed an oil town or a small city, Fort McMurray, um, in 2016. So tell us a little bit about Fort McMurray and tell us what it was like before this fire hit it. What was it? What's the before of this place? Fort McMurray is an anomaly in North America and really in the world. It's a very large and well-funded petroleum hub 600 miles north of the U.S. border, deep in the boreal forest. The nearest other major city is a five-hour drive to the south. Uh, So it exists really in isolation. Uh, Roughly 100,000 people, permanent and temporary workers combined, working on the largest, most energy-intensive, really most polluting uh, hydrocarbon extraction project anywhere in the world. And this is the, the, the bituminous tar sands of Alberta. So it's not oil that they are drilling up there. It is bituminous sand that they are mining and melting uh, with the assistance of literally billions of cubic feet of natural gas per day. Hmm. So it's an extraordinarily intensive and hydrocarbon recovery project that the result of which is melted tar that then needs to be heated again to extract this very low cra- low grade synthetic crude uh, that then can be processed in certain types of southern refineries on the U.S. border. It's a very strange animal. Some people have found ways to make money at it, uh, but it's really a a kind of 
barbarous uh, enterprise, and and the the extent of the the destruction to the boreal forest is so vast that you can literally see these mines from six thousand miles above the surface of the earth. So this is it's not just visible from space; it's visible from outer space. Wow. And so the whole the whole city of Fort, of Fort McMurray exists only for the, the extraction of bitumen, and it's made the, it made the people there pretty prosperous, didn't it? Even a, I read somewhere that even a small town, a small house, was like one hundred fifty thousand dollars or something like that. Oh, uh, Toby, a small house is five hundred thousand dollars. Wow. Yeah, five hundred thousand to a million, uh, and and you could buy a little trailer home, you know, like a caravan that would cost you about two hundred grand. Wow. And, and, and to give you an idea of the, of the incomes people are making, so 2016, when the fire broke out, uh, was two years past a global downturn in oil prices that was really sent you know, ripples through the entire uh, petroleum industry on a global scale. In spite of that downturn, the median household income in Fort McMurray was still $200,000 a year, making it certainly the wealthiest municipality in Canada and probably in Marin County. I mean, you'd probably have to go to Westchester, New York, or Marin County, California to find comparable incomes. It's, and, and again, this is a, a, a city in total isolation, really almost more like Novosibirsk than any city most of us are familiar with. And why is the extract, what, what makes the extraction process for bitumen so ferociously destructive? Why is it so horrible? <laughs> because it it it's really going against uh, what nature intended. Uh, so you know what's up there under Fort McMurray is a New York State sized deposit of bituminous sand. So it's a giant sand dune with forest a thin layer of forest over the top, and it's permeated with bitumen, with literally with tar. This is what you seal your driveway with. It's what you seal a house foundation with, and Somehow, uh, people got it into their mind that this this could be a source of oil, especially as U.S. supplies began to dwindle. And this this all was starting, you know, following World War II, uh, and pe- and as the easier, the low hanging fruit, if you will, the the ready flowing oil coming out of Texas and Pennsylvania and Oklahoma uh, and California began to to dry up. People started looking further afield and. They found these uh, bitumen deposits, and a process was developed uh, in the early 20th century for melting this stuff out. And because, I mean, I think it's really it's an economy of scale, and it also is a a measure of the of the value that in which we hold nature, which is really quite low. The demand on the forest, the demand on the local water supply, the demand on on the natural gas supply is so vast, and it's so frankly inefficient. But it's because in Canada, resources come cheap, and they're, and they're had very cheaply. And so this is, in a way, the fur trade replaying itself in bitumen. Yeah. So life before a- April, May 2016 was this, it was, a, it was an oil town, very isolated. And then... Something not that unusual happened. A forest fire happened, but this forest fire was not like anything before it. What what were the what were the circumstances prior to the fire breaking out that made made fire number nine this particular fire so distinctive? Well, I, the people on the surface, if you will, uh, the, the people of Fort McMurray were living this beautiful simulacrum of a subarctic suburban life, and you know. Very, you know, wonderful incomes. Uh, you could have a single single family worker at home, and you know, mom or dad could stay at home with the kids. And it was a very, um, very strong uh, community of faith, and people were very involved in their bubble of life that was really quite beautiful and quite successful. And meanwhile, in the forest, this parallel reality was unfolding. And so, if you spoke to any forest fire scientist, any hydrologist, they would say there are some ominous things happening in the boreal forest. The boreal forest is the largest forest system on earth. It circumnavigates the Northern Hemisphere. It goes all the way through Russia, known as the Taiga, all the way across uh, Scandinavia, 
uh, lands on Iceland, lands on Newfoundland, and then runs across Canada all the way through Alaska and back to Russia again. It's a vast system. It's the largest source of fresh water anywhere on Earth. But it is also drying out. And that this trend has been underway for about the past half century. So the forest looks relatively normal on the surface. But in 2016, we had two severe drought years. We had an El Nino that, despite the fact that it's in the Pacific Ocean, impacts weather systems all the way into the interior of Alberta, uh, which is, you know, a thousand miles from the coast. And so you had this slow, long-term drying trend overlapping with this quite severe drought uh, that, that reduced snowpack by 50% and resulted in really low rainfall. And so even you know pine cones and leaves in May 2016 were crunching underfoot normally the way they would in August or September. So then on top of that, you have temperatures of 33 Celsius. And, and that, that's a, a southern temperature. That is not a boreal Canadian temperature. A boreal Canadian temperature is 8 to 12, maybe 15 Celsius. You can get up to, set to 20 on a really hot day. We're at 33 Celsius. So, so that the temperature on May 3rd blew through the standing record for that day by about 7 degrees Celsius. That's an extreme aberration. Meanwhile, and this in a way is the more pernicious detail that is really easy for humans to not notice. Uh, and that is the relative humidity. And, you know, we know the difference between hot and dry and, and desert and, and Britain, for example. But the um, relative humidity in Fort McMurray on May 3rd, 2016 was 11%. When we would walk outside and we'd think, oh, what a lovely, dry, sunny day. Uh, you know, your laundry's going to dry more quickly on a day like that. If you actually look at 11% humidity and look at where else in the world you find this level of, of dryness, you have to go to Death Valley in the month of July. Wow. So now you have a southern desert temperature and a southern desert level of dryness in what is historically and naturally an already flammable ecosystem. So the boreal forest regenerates itself through fire. It's a natural process. And it burns colossally, even under ordinary circumstances. So you can have a 1,000 square mile fire, and it won't even make the news, because the forest up there is so vast and the population is so low. But now you have that size of a fire, that scale of a fire in a flammable ecosystem that has now been tweaked with 33 Celsius temperatures and 11% humidity with the wind bearing down on the largest city for hundreds of miles around. And that is a disaster. That's, you know, like Hurricane Katrina or something like that. It's that scale. So what you describe in the book is is a, is a fire, and the, this was an area that was prone to forest fires, but it wasn't like anything they'd ever seen before in its characteristics because of these environmental qualities, as you say. So how did that fire manifest that was so different? I mean, because you write about it, phenomenally, it's horrifying and unputdownable, your accounts of this fire. It's, it's, it's an extraordinary piece of writing. Well, thank, thank you, Toby. It, it's doing what we do as writers, I, I find, especially in nonfiction, the, the real challenge is to rise to the level of your material. Yeah. You know, what, what is out there is so amazing and it requires you to really dig deep just to, to try to match it, to attempt to match it. So, and, and this fire is a good example of that. So really quick science lesson, radiant heat is the kind of heat that comes uh, off the candle that tells you not to touch it. So it's invisible, but it warns you. And radiant heat moves at the speed of light. The radiant heat coming off the Fort McMurray fire into the city of Fort McMurray in the form of flames that were 100 meters tall across a front about 10 kilometers wide. The radiant heat coming off that was about 500 Celsius. Yeah. <laughs> so this, this is hotter than Venus. Mm. And so... As you can imagine, everything in front of it is dried out instantly. Everything in front of it is then elevated to combustible temperatures. And what fire feeds on is vapor. 
that if you throw a big log on a little fire, you'll just squash the fire and put it out. What what the fire is doing with the heat is heating the hydrocarbon up. It doesn't matter if it's gasoline or a log or a plastic chair or your pants. You know, it it heats it up until it starts to vaporize. And that's what feeds the fire. That's what the fire can engage with. So what's happening now with 500 Celsius radiant heat entering the city is you have hundreds of, uh, sorry, thousands of houses covered in vinyl siding, covered in tar shingles with vinyl windows and all kinds of plastic laminates and glues in the plywood, in the laminate flooring. You've got snow tires, you've got winter tires, you've got gas grills, you've got plastic playground equipment. All of that now is vaporizing. And, And we can't see it, but the fire can see it. And what the fire sees, metaphorically speaking, is this huge, superabundant cloud of fuel. And fire's a lot like us. We move toward the energy. Yeah, Energy is super appealing to us, and it's also just as appealing to fire. And so it moves into that space. And because everything is superheated, we've all seen a house fire, and it's, and it's really scary, but it's also quite slow. The houses in Fort McMurray burnt to the basement in five minutes. Why? And that is because they combusted in their entirety instantly. And firefighters were describing this to me, and I was sure they were exaggerating. I I was sure that because of the adrenaline and anxiety, you know, they were kind of collapsing time. But I pressed them on this, and it was verified. And then I spoke to physicists who specialize in, in house combustion, and they said, yeah, it's possible, but you have to look at situations like the Hamburg firestorm in World War II to find comparables. But now this is what nature can do on its own. Wow. And the other thing that's absolute, and apart from the sheer size of the fire, is something that you hinted at a moment ago, which is the speed. Exp- human beings struggle with exponential growth as an idea, I think. But you capture it. You capture it really. Will you, will you talk a, a little about the... the the rapidity of its expansion. This is a really terrifying uh, trait or characteristic of, of 21st century fire, as I call it. Uh, and we saw this, you know, to, to grievous effect in Lahaina and, and we, uh, uh, Hawaii that burned terribly recently. We saw it in Paradise, California in 2018. We saw it in Redding, California in 2018 in the form of an actual fire tornado. Uh, we saw it in Enterprise Northwest Territories, a little hamlet most people have never heard of that burnt to the ground in about 45 minutes just this summer. And, and when you have these lower humidities and these higher temperatures, it, these are invisible thresholds that, that we are crossing uh, that we have li- little awareness of, but the fire has a keen awareness of. And, and what that lower humidity and higher temperature enables is it basically means all the fire's energy can go into combustion. It doesn't need to heat anything up. It doesn't need to dry anything out. It can just move in there and combust. And so what burns these communities down typically is not the fire front itself. It's the embers driving ahead of it on the wind. And so these embers, which, you know, where you are right now, where I am right now, if embers started landing on our gardens or or, or on our porches, they would probably fizzle and go out. But when you have 11% humidity, 33 Celsius, those embers are going to land and they're going to ignite. And so what, I mean, almost, you know, what, what the Russians are doing in Ukraine with their phosphorus bombs that light everything on fire, that is what wildfires can do now to communities is literally tens of thousands of these tiny embers raining down in advance of the fire front that start innumerable small fires. And then as, as they catch, suck it, they suck in the main fire front. And so you get this um, kind of synerg- this really terrible synergy that um, results, frankly, in a, in, you know, what a, a firestorm is not an overstatement. And as you say, within 24 hours, I think it had, you say it had increased 500-fold, and then it was doubling every few hours in size. These are yeah. unimaginable speed. That is something that human beings are, are not ready for or, or calibrated to yet. And, 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 and again, 
you know, what I saw in Fort McMurray in those in those three days, the fire ignited on May 1st, it entered the city on May 3rd, it actually stayed in, inside the city for more than a week, you know, longer than the Great Fire of London burned. What we're, what we're not ready for is, is, is the speed with which it moves. And, 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 and that is, uh, I think, a, a metaphor for really what, how climate change is impacting us. And what you see in terms of the city of Fort McMurray's response to the fire between May 1st, when it first ignited, and May 3rd, when it entered the city, is a kind of collapsed example of how our civilization is responding to climate change. The warnings were there. We saw, metaphorically speaking, the plume on the horizon. You know, back in the 50s and 60s and 70s, we saw it. And, you know, people said what they said. They did what they did. And then suddenly it's upon us. And 2023 has really been a signal year. Uh, Extraordinary things have happened across the globe, whether you're following floods, whether you're following fire, whether you're following sea surface temperature, whether you're following... Uh, coral bleaching, or, or it really doesn't matter. Every, every indicator of climate distress has amplified uh, in, in really disturbing ways just this year. So we're at that gradually and then suddenly uh, moment uh, in climate change, just as the residents of Fort McMurray were uh, at lunchtime on May 3rd. And part of the genius of your book uh, is exactly the, the, the story works brilliantly as a sort of horrifying disaster movie, but it's also the most remarkable parable about both humanity's ability to comprehend, apprehend climate change, and also about reaping what you sow, because this is an oil town that's destroyed by climate change as well. I mean, it works on many levels brilliantly. I mean, when did you realize as a writer that this material was going to be so amazingly rich? Well, Fort McMurray had, had been in my consciousness for years because it, it's such a strange beast. You know, n- nobody else, nowhere else in the world are hydrocarbons drawn from the earth in this way. Uh, so, and, and it's so, you know, violating and strange and extreme. And it's defeated many writers. Lots of writers have gone up there and tried to write about it. Uh, this fire created a kind of a, a counterpoint to it and, 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 a, and a really terrible irony in that you know, huge amounts of fire energy are imposed on Fort McMurray in the form of natural burning natural gas to melt this bitumen out of the ground. Meanwhile, the forest, what they call the overburden that they, they bulldoze off in the thousands of acres, uh, actually contains more energy, as we discovered on May 3rd when that fire uh, exploded into the city. And so uh, to me, that created a you know a really interesting tension, and then uh, the evacuation um, was so extraordinary in that everybody got out. That almost ninety thousand people, I think you say, don't you? Everybody got out, and and then you you go a little deeper into Fort McMurray, and you realize that, and, and according to the twenty sixteen census, you know not only are people make the average income is two hundred thousand dollars a year, but there are eighty different first languages spoken in that city. One. So, so it is a true Babel sitting by itself deep in the subarctic. And you have every different kind of religion, every skin color. And, and yet, uh, you know, when all hell broke loose, and that's not an overstatement, the, the social net closed and gathered everyone up. You know, for days and days, nobody knew if they were going to find a skeleton in, in a basement somewhere. Uh, and th- no one was left behind. And, and, and that, to me, is, is very, very moving uh, in, the, in the face of this, you know, a, a bona fide cataclysm. Apocalyptic event, absolutely. And- a- absolutely. It's really not exaggerating. Mo- many people did not know if they were going to ever see their families again as they started evacuating. Uh, there, there was fire everywhere. Anyone who's listening to this uh, podcast can uh, possibly find on YouTube footage that is absolutely staggering. I mean, of Australian fires and Canadian fires, uh, external flashovers that do take the breath away. This looks like the end of the world. I was going to say, I mean, there's a, we're slightly running out of time, even though I think we're only just beginning. The, um, <laughs> the, 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 the leaders of the, t- the town acquitted itself wonderfully in the face of this catastrophe, but the leaders of the town were shockingly slow to this impending disaster, weren't they? Tell us a little bit about that, because it's very dramatic in the book. Well, I, th- I think... 
Toby, this is the Lucretius problem in action, and and we get to see it playing out in real time. And you know, it's it really reminded me of the War of the Worlds, uh, where you know, with this this strength, there's this strange presence that we see, alien presence on the periphery of the town, and we get the experts in, we get uh, you know, firefighters, you know, you know, relatively, you know, metaphorically speaking, the military, you know, is comment commenting on how we're going to fight this thing, and they respond to it. Um, th- there's a strange detachment, and it, and you could really see this, you know, to to the point that most people in the city did not find out that they should be evacuating until the fire showed up in their neighborhood or one of their friends or family called them. And this is despite the fact that uh, a whole network of authorities had been assembled in the form of a, of a, a, a regional emergency operations center uh, two days prior. And, and so they're all talking to each other. They're all processing, you know, fantastic information. The climate predictions were excellent. The meteorologists made perfect assessments. You know, the wind changed exactly when they said it would. So you could see this coming almost the way you could see a, hurric- a hurricane coming across the ocean. And yet they delayed and they didn't call an evacuation until neighborhoods were literally already on fire. And that is really disturbing. And I think one of the reasons this happened is because there is a multi-billion dollar petroleum industry uh, that never shuts down. And that's who uh, lives in that city are those employees. Yeah, The petroleum industry is so powerful in Alberta and, and in Canada that it really trumps everything, and we don't want to shut this machine down. So there's sort of another metaphor, if you will. Yeah, I mean, the, the, we are being told by nature right now that we are overheating. We are effectively gassing ourselves to death, and yet the petroleum industry is expanding right now and has made it very clear it, it has no intention of slowing down. And what we saw there on May 3rd was this fire chief and a mayor uh, who were kind of cowed, I think, in a way, just by this sheer inertia of the petroleum industry. You know, if you call an evacuation, all those workers in their tens of thousands are going to have to come back into town. Is that going to create more chaos? And so there are some real logistical concerns to calling an evacuation, but it's uh, it it shows the tension between do we keep business as usual uh, or do we actually respond to this impending disaster in a in a meaningful and timely way, it's um, it reminded me reading about it of the, um, a previous winner of the Beta Gifford Prize for Nonfiction, a book about Chernobyl by Serhii Plotki, where the leaders of the power the power station um, are in complete denial about the scale of the catastrophe that's just about to break out over them. It's incredible. It's very similar. I, I think it's and and I think be, because. There's a kind of awe that we have over, you know, toward nuclear power plants. There's a kind of awe that Albertans and Fort McMurrayites have toward the bitumen mines. They're they're so massive. They've, you know, uh, enabled uh, such wealth to be generated. They're they're such a huge influence and they are so massive and complex that the idea of shutting them down, that the idea that there could be a force out there bigger and stronger than them. Is is basically inconceivable, you know. So it's really human hubris, but it's understandable when you see the size of these plants. I mean, they, they stretch for miles. Yeah. You know that they're really, uh, truly vast, and and they dominate the landscape. It's a shocking parable. Um, in a, we, we're nearly out of time, but I was reading in a pre- preparing for this conversation. I read that um, somewhere, I think it while you, while you were the writer in residence at. Uh, Athabasca University, you talked about unlearning what you know and the process of learning and unlearning while you were researching this fire. Mm. What, what did you mean by that? Well, it, that was a while back, Toby, but I think what I meant was um, we bring a lot of baggage to the table, no matter what table we we join. And I live on the coast, you know, in a city, pretty left-leaning politically, I have my own feelings about the the bitumen industry, and I realized all of that would be an impediment to me uh, going into Fort McMurray. 
And so I, and that's where I think, you know, as a writer, especially as a nonfiction writer, I think self-knowledge is really key. You kind of have to know where your own liabilities are. You really have to know where your own biases are. And so I made a, a, a very conscious effort to, to le- set those aside and try to go in there neutrally and humbly, you know, really as a student. And I was, frankly, richly rewarded. People were very good to me up there. People were really forthcoming. And, you know, you can imagine, oh, I'm a, I'm a journalist from Vancouver, and Canadians have a lot of feelings about Vancouverites. And I, and I sail into Fort McMurray and say, oh, by the way, and I'm, uh, can you, uh, could you tell me about the worst day of your life? You know, I, I'm, I'm here for a few days. And, uh, you know, there's a two-word response to that, <laughs> that that's, that's totally understandable and, frankly, justifiable. Nobody said that to me. People sat down with me. People spoke to me literally for hours. People cried with me. Uh, it, it was a it was an amazing experience that really changed me. It really opened my heart, and it also, frankly, seared my soul. You know, the, the damage that I saw up there, not just to the neighborhoods, you know, which had been absolutely razed, uh, but to the people. You know, people are are deeply wounded by this event. And did you detect amongst the people in Fort McMurray six, seven years on as well, um, a change in attitude towards the hydrocarbon industry and views of climate change? Uh, Toby, it, it, one of the, the biggest takeaways for me from this book is people will go to almost any length to maintain their status quo. So no, Fort McMurray has rebuilt itself in a bigger, grander image of what it was. Uh, they are expanding uh, the bitumen mines up there. They're, the current premier, you know, the, the governor of, of that province is an avowed climate denier. They have just put a moratorium on renewable energy projects in the province to favor further petroleum development. Wow. Um, I mean, really, they, they live in this parallel world. And I think a lot of us have thought, Oh, you know, as people go through these climate disasters, they're they're going to become converts, you know, to the climate cause, if you will. It doesn't work that way. Uh, what what people really want is their old life back. I, I want to keep doing the thing that I used to do that was working for me, and I don't want to be traumatized out of my old life. And but that is what has happened. So everyone I interviewed up there all of them are in a very different place now. They've either left the city or they have really serious respiratory issues from fighting the fire, or they have really lost faith in their institutions uh, that they used to believe in, um, or they've, they've bought houses uh, or, or trailers in very different parts of the country in case they get burned out again. Mm. Um, and you know, PTSD is, is a real thing in Canada. 200,000 people were evacuated due to fire just this summer. Uh, and I really think we've almost got a new psychiatric uh, designation now, which would be post-evacuation PTSD. And uh, there's a lot of it in Canada. Uh, we, really had our, we really had a black summer uh, this summer, or it was a real catastrophe. And for McMurray, though it was seven years earlier, it gave a kind of preview of, of that, of the scale of, of the impacts that, that we can expect. Well, you've given the listeners to this podcast an extraordinary preview of your um, remarkable book. That was fascinating and gripping and disturbing. Thank you so much, John, for taking the time to join us. That's it for today. We'd like, as always, to thank the Blavatnik Family Foundation for its continued and generous support of this podcast. Join us again on the Read Smart podcast in the coming days and weeks, where we'll be speaking to the five other authors in contention for the 2023 Bailey Gifford Prize. The winner will be announced at a ceremony at the Science Museum in London, generously supported by the Blavatnik Family Foundation on Thursday, the 16th of November. The winner announcement will also be live streamed across the Bailey Gifford Prize not for non-fiction social channels and on YouTube. If you're interested in finding out more about the shortlist, you can visit our website or follow us on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and TikTok at BG Prize. You can also sign up for our newsletter to keep up with the latest developments. Thank you for listening. See you again next time. Read Smart, the Bailey Gifford Prize for Nonfiction podcast. This podcast is generously supported by the Blavatnik Family Foundation.